Sifu Deng Mingdao is a Chinese-American author, artist, philosopher, teacher, and martial artist who, from a young age, has studied Taoist internal arts such as Qigong and Kung Fu. This is Deng Mingdao's second appearance on Transformations, and here we discuss an entirely different set of topics, including why Taoism, gender identity, the role of a teacher, the ego trap, self-cultivation, acquiring and maintaining skills, a little segue into jazz, Tai Chi and Kung Fu, why one shouldn't emulate their teachers, and more. I hope you enjoyed listening to my conversation with Deng Mingdao as much as I enjoyed having it. Welcome to the Transformations Podcast. Here, guests and I will share our transformative experiences and we'll explore how to find excellence in life. Sifu Deng Mingdao, thank you so much for joining us today on the Transformations Podcast. Uh, I've read so many of your books over the years and, you, and your writing has had an influence on me and many people that I know that uh, it's a pleasure to have you today and to talk to you and see you face to face. Thank you. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Your writings in your life are really, uh, I assume your life, so I'll just say your writings and your public life are really couched in the philosophy of Taoism. Um, and I wonder what of those principles and teachings do you pull to guide you the most in your day to day, or do you? I'm most attracted to Taoism because it answered all my questions. And mm. the second aspect is that it puts the responsibility for your own life squarely in your own hands. You don't have to depend on a god. You don't need a priest, but you do have to take action. It's not a matter of belief or getting a membership somewhere. It's a matter of what you do each day. That's empowering because everything that you want to do is possible with your own work. Nobody can withhold it and nobody can give you permission to get it. You make it yourself. And that's why I find Taoism so powerful. Now, Taoism, if you look at it closely, is related to nature. But here I have to make a distinction. We don't talk about nature as a separate subject. Nature is termed heaven and earth. That's the totality of our universe. So although you see translations that use the word nature, and it may seem like an odd point, but it's more important to talk about being natural. And natural means that you blend with heaven and earth, it also means that you blend with your own personality because the question is, what is natural to you? And that's not just, oh, I happen to like this or I wanna do this and so on. It's really a question of what is your inner character and how do you fit in with your environment? You have to ask what is natural to you because that is the easiest and most fulfilling path for you. And that blends with your circumstances, which are natural. It blends with your personality and your age at that time, which is natural, because we can't make the same decisions at 60 that we would have made at 20 and vice versa. You have to do what's natural to your time in your life. That does mean you have to have skill and cultivation because the cultivation clears away the impediments to you being natural. And you need skill to be with the natural, just like a farmer. A farmer has to uh, live their entire life in concert with the land and the sky. But they need to respond not just with their work and effort, but with their abilities. So this is why I follow Taoism. It's a natural path. It puts the responsibility solely on the person. It advocates self-cultivation so you can be more in tune to nature. You do have to work and you do need skill and those both take practice. So that's why I follow Taoism. That's a very um, organized way of, of talking about it. I haven't heard someone actually just break it down so simply but complex. So I would like to just circle into 
this idea of what feels natural for you? Are we talking about something that resonates with you in, instinctively uh, or something that you I, identify with, although I don't like using the word identify, um, rather say resonates? Um, and how can you find that of what is really doing that and that it's not some kind of outside programming making you think that that's what your nature is? The simple answer is that you have to look within. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself what feels right. That's a difficult path to establish in the beginning because as you allude, you have to stop listening to other people. I don't mean that you shouldn't take advice and you shouldn't learn and so on, but nobody can give you the answer to anything, the final answer. And you can go to professionals and you should, you can avail yourself of people who make things or you need a contractor and so on, but the ultimate decisions still lie with you and nobody can tell you what that ultimate decision should be. So you have to make every decision and you cannot abdicate that to anyone, not a doctor, not a lawyer, not your spouse, nobody. And how do you know? You need to know your sense of purpose in life. Why are you here? What do you want to do? And so it gets very easy. Will this decision get me closer to my goal? Or will it take me away from my goal? Would it help me reach it faster? Or might it take me away completely? Might it be a waste of time? Might it be something that I will hate doing? And why will I hate doing it? Because it doesn't fit with my purpose. Now, this purpose is never something easy like, oh, I want to be a rock star. Or I'm going to become a doctor. It has to be unique to you. Do you see the acceptance that's involved there? Can you accept yourself? Because it's easy if you find yourself with a destiny that you're as famous as Taylor Swift. It's hard when you find, hey, I mess everything up. I can't do things. I have health challenges. I don't have a lot of money. I wasn't raised very properly. My education is incomplete. And so you look at all the other people and go, well, hey, I got no chance. That is not true. You have to look at that pattern and say, with all of that, I am still a living and breathing human being. The irony is we don't know how long we have on this earth. So we better do something, shouldn't we? Right? And whatever you are, however you might feel about yourself, that is who you should be. That is who you are. And we have to make our decisions based on that. And we have to have a sense of direction. And that direction is based on our own inner sense of purpose. It makes me think today when we're talking about this, that we have kind of a new layer of, of awareness that the kids are needing to get with their idea of their gender identities. And this is a very hot topic amongst psychologists and doctors and parents and teachers and kids. How does one come to, to know what, what is within them to make that choice? Does that require a teacher? Or is there a way that a youngster could learn the skills necessary to be able to go? And I have four children. I don't know without me telling them how to meditate or to look inside that they would know how to do that naturally. Okay, so we're, we're mixing two topics here, okay. right? Okay, so um, let's take the issue of gender, in this case, as a metaphor. Sure. I take it that it's a metaphor for how do you discover who you are uniquely? Indeed. And as a metaphor, it's an illustration of the fact that we cannot always step into traditional roles. Oh, this is a man, this is a woman, that's it. Even among, let's say, cisgender men or women, there are so many different kinds, aren't there? So let's not be distracted by gender identity. Even within one group, let's just say heterosexual men, how many variations are there? 
there are so many variations. And the problem is not that there is variation. The problem is our society is so bankrupt and so intellectually poor that they want to squeeze everyone into these little categories. Well, that's ridiculous, right? That's the way you run a supermarket. That's not the way you run a society. So the one problem is I don't, and I know transgender people. I know gay people. None of them have a problem knowing who they are. Mm -hmm. Their problem is the rejection of society. So it's not them knowing. They know. Yeah. It's the rest of us who just don't follow along. So to speak to the families and other people, how do you know? Listen to them. There isn't a single gay person or transgender person who isn't able to talk about themselves. The problem is nobody listens. Okay, but you asked about children and how does somebody know and so on? And how, and do you need a teacher? And I don't know about everyone who's listening to this broadcast, but in my view, yes, you need a teacher. You not only need a teacher, you need many teachers. But in terms of spirituality and martial arts, for example, you definitely need a teacher. Let me give you an illustration, an example. I learned poetry from a wonderful mentor. And one day he sat me down in the car and he told me all these stanzas of poetry. Not one was written in a book. And I've read dozens of poetry instruction manuals. None of them were in a book. And yet when I learned all those standards and I applied them to any poem I read in translation or in English or anything, they all applied. That's an illustration of what a good teacher does. They open the door for you. They impart knowledge that isn't in books, but comes from life and experience. And now we have this diversionary infatuation with ChatGPT that can only tell you what everybody knows and it averages it out. But it can't open doors for you like a living human being can. So yes, you need a teacher and you need a good teacher. I agree wholeheartedly. When I read old martial arts books, or books on Taoism or Buddhism, there's poems, sayings, and and you, without a teacher to explain it, you can't figure it out. That's right. You can't ask questions of a book. Right. And you need to have a living person with whom you can speak, who can walk through life with you yeah. and say, did you see that? Or here's how you deal with that and so on to protect you sometimes to rescue you, to yank you back when you stumble. It's not just about, quote, book knowledge. It's about that companionship, that care, that passing on of a living tradition. And in martial arts and Taoism, there is a living tradition. And like anything else, you need to get life from life. Nobody is born from dead people. Yeah. Nobody became a great person without being with living teachers. I agree. I have a, a fondness for mentors uh, in my life, always seeking out mentors for writing, for martial arts, for spirituality, um, and just marriage, you know, <laughs> raising kids. There's so many areas in our life that we need mentors for, people who have um, the wisdom of their experience to share mm -hmm. and to help guide. Mm -hmm. um, my mother, um, and she's deceased, but she was a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And she wrote, uh, it hasn't been published yet, but she wrote a book on grief and dealing with grief or loss. And um, But in her life, there was a lot of grief and she didn't follow the rules in the book. And I tried to sit down with her and say, you know, mom, you, you outline these things and they're really good practices. Would you like me to work through them with you? 
She's like, don't tell me about my book. I wrote, and when she was in her grief space, she was in her ego space and I'm the psychologist space. And those ego traps got in the way of her allowing me to be her mentor for a moment with her own work. Uh, so I guess what I'm circling to is the is uh, to talk about how to release our ego to accept the 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 knowledge and the teachings of a mentor and a teacher. So many people are just shut off from others. They get very defensive with feedback, even from ones they love. Okay, so there are a couple angles to this. So let's put ourselves in the view of a mentor. Mm -hmm. Every mentor will be fallible. There is no such thing as a person who is infallible. They're going to flub things up. They're going to make mistakes and so on. So, but the important thing is to observe how they deal with their fallibility. It's diversionary and unproductive to say, hey, you know, look, you don't drive very well or you can't get to class on time. So, hey, I'm not going to follow you. That's not the point. How is that person dealing with their own fallibility? That is a lesson too. By the way, they are going to be limited by their own ability. In other words, they can be superb in their art. And that will also be their limitation. I mentioned my poetry teacher. I love his poetry still, and unfortunately he's passed away. But it was of its time. It's not a universal form of poetry. It happens to be the form I like. You practice martial arts. If somebody is good in one style, that means they might not be good at another. And that is not a criticism. That is not a reason to reject them. No matter how good we are in a style, our style will have its limitations too. And how your mentor deals with that is a lesson. But now, let me ask you from the point of view of a master or a mentor, how do we make sure that we don't do a disservice to our students? We remain accountable. We admit our limitations and our mistakes. I'm almost 70. I can't do the same things I did when I was in my 20s. And I don't try to pretend, hey, you know, I'm just as flexible as I was in my 20s. No, I'm not. I try, but I'm not. Okay? So instead of lamenting what I don't have, I should look at what I do have because I have developed other abilities since my 20s, and I should rely on that. But I'm not going to say to my students, hey, don't look at the fact that I can't do this because that's how a lot of Chinese teachers are. And I don't lie because a lot of Chinese teachers do. They don't know the answers, so they make something up. And when they make it up, then their students take it as doctrine, and then a lot of misconceptions get perpetuated. So how do you deal with this as a teacher? You admit your limitations, you don't lie, you stay accountable, and you remember your purpose is for the sake of the other person, not you. There's so many Chinese teachers, can I say even most, where all, all they want is to have your allegiance. That is irrelevant to me. I don't try to hold students to me. I don't try to hold children to me because if I do my job right, they will voluntarily want to come back and see me. Not because, oh, dad said I have to come home right? So this is what we do. Now, you asked from a student's level, how do you release your ego? You are going to get criticized. And why are you going to get criticized? Because you are there to have your faults eliminated. So if you go, well, I don't like hearing this about me, well, then that's your stupidity. You have to be sure you're with a kind and generous and open-minded mentor 
Because if you're with one of these mentors who's just trying to use you or draw you to them or create a cult-like situation, then of course you're not safe. But with your, if you're with a truly selfless mentor who wants you to get the art, you have to take the criticism. Now, I was um, trained as an art student and creative writing. You have to take criticisms. Your work, your art, or your writing is going to be put up for the whole class and everyone gets to criticize it, not just the teacher. And if you didn't get your point across, it's your fault. And isn't it better to know that you messed up than to say, oh, no, don't say that about me. I can't take it. Right? Let me give you an example. I was in a high school creative writing class and this guy's piece was being torn to pieces and he finally yelped, but it really happened that way. If you didn't write it so people could believe it, it doesn't matter if, quote, it really happened that way. To shout that out is an utter failure. I still get criticized all the time in class. I go to class and I come back and I go, do I know anything? <laughs> because <laughs> after all this time, shouldn't I be at it? But no, it's like, what, what, the hand is, what? Like, oh, I don't have those abilities. Since I don't have those abilities, Am I going to get mad at my teacher for pointing it out that I'm inadequate? Or do I say, this is my assignment now. And I have to work on this until I do get it. And I'm sorry to tell you, I'm rather pitiful. <laughs> some things that take me a year or two to develop. And I'm doing the drills a hundred times a day, more than a hundred times. And I still can't do it. Do I say, oh, you know, how awful I am. Well, actually, yes, I get depressed every day. Okay. I still can't do it. I still can't do it. I still can't do it. But I have to get up and try again, right? It's not the teacher's fault. It's not the fault of the style. It's not the fault of the criticism. It's my fault. But if it's my fault, that means I can fix it. So instead of going, well, I don't like being criticized and that's an ego problem and so on. Do you see it's an assignment and you set about remedying that assignment? It might not be flattering, but you're not in class to be flattered. Do I wish that I was somebody who could walk on the floor and do 10 cartwheels and drop down into the splits and stand still for on one leg for five minutes? Yeah, I do that. that. No, <laughs> I never would. Anyway, way, yeah, I intentionally am with a teacher who I can never, will never, ever equal. the The height is too much, and I don't have that training, and I'm old, and so on. But I'm going to try so that I can be as high as I can possibly be. I'm not someone who says, hey, you know, that I know all these styles, that's good enough. Or I hear from people who say, you know what, I've been practicing for 30 years and I just let my style be whatever I want it to be and so oh, wow. on. Yeah. It doesn't work. I don't see anyone going into calculus and saying that <laughs> or driving a car or becoming an engineer. So nobody says that about their own profession. Oh, I'll just have it be whatever I want it to be. But somehow, because it's all Taoism and martial arts, oh, I can be whatever I want it to be. No, you're trying to get to certain standards. Yeah. And you might not make it. I probably won't make it. But you have to go as high as you can. Indeed. And that's part of the 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 purpose of self-cultivation uh, is to just keep cultivating to reach those levels, physical or intellectual or financial, if, if that's where you are. And I think that leads to the whole premise of the saying that it's the journey, not the destination, because if you're only looking at destinations and you don't get there, you may drop out or be too hard on yourself or stop striving. 
you know, keep your eye on the prize, but keep moving. Keep well, moving forward. there's some implications to that, right? First of all, on a spiritual level, there is no destination. And it's important not to ask for a reward. If we practice and meditate expecting certain things, they will elude you. Mm -hmm. You will not get there. And it's such a contradiction to our normal expectations in society. We only do things for a result. We only yeah. do things for profit. Oh, what do you do? Uh, martial arts every day? Do you make money at it? No, you don't make any money at it. Are you famous? No. Did you win trophies? No. Uh, well, then why are you doing it? You see, the better way to practice Taoism and martial arts is purely for its own sake. Okay. And then the results will come. As soon as you say, I have to do it for the sake of this, you're going to be lost. You have to do it for its own sake. The second thing I want to point out to you um, are examples of people who did complete the journey, who did become great masters and so on. And you know what? Then they declined after that. My uh, current teacher um, grew up with people who were, were national champions, breathtaking performances, stuff that just left your mouth hanging open. And most of them don't practice anymore. Yeah. So they're fat. They're uh, inflexible. They boast of having the three highs because they don't realize it's bad. High cholesterol, high blood pressure. <laughs> high blood sugar. They think it's a sign of prosperity. Yeah, well... So, you know, someone like me might say, oh, I'm never going to get there because of my own limitations. But I know people who got there and then fell off the mountain. So what's better? The person of little talent who keeps trying every day or the person of award-winning championship talent who has let themselves decline and are subject to the same chronic illnesses of anybody else. I think it's better to keep practicing, don't you? Absolutely. And I think this gets to your uh, just point of a moment ago, that if we're looking for the result, we're going to have a, a, a negative or adverse effect. And maybe some of these champions their whole result was I need to win the gold medal or the trophy or the tournament or the gymnastics. And after they got it, it's like, well, that's done now. Time to move on to something else. And they just stop everything because there's no more goal. But really the goal has got to be self-awareness and wellness and calm, tranquility, different things. Remember what I said about purpose? You see, Absolutely. a lot of them, because they were chosen as children and this became both their education and their job they only saw their families once a week uh then they didn't necessarily have that championship as their purpose they were just doing what they were trained and told to do and by coincidence they had the body the talent to excel yeah but it didn't jive with their purpose and now they don't have a purpose elsewhere anyway. And I, we don't even have to talk about the championship teams. There are guys I grew up with who were, oh my God, you know, great martial arts champions on crutches, hmm. all sorts of chronic health issues, dead. What good is it to be a great master a promising disciple if you don't go all the way and keep your art into old age is it enough that you were the flying stellar person at 20 
What about at 50, 60, 70, 80? You have to set your goals for life, not just, oh, I want to see my name in lights. On your Facebook page, um, I check it often, but not every day. So I'm assuming that you put up a quote, a saying, a thought, a meditation each day. I do. You do. And some of the things uh, that I liked, um, I made some notes up to talk to you about. And one just pulls right into this discussion, which is you made a posting about what is a practice and why you practice. So a practice, I think in, in this definition, and please correct me, is something more than just going to gymnastics class or going to karate class, right? If you're talking about a practice, are you talking about something that is more um, more holistic for you as an individual or just the act of going and attending a class? Attending a class is quite it's just a follow. personal practice. Right. Going to class is not necessarily your practice. Going to class is just learning new techniques, setting new goals. The practice is what you do every day to train yourself. And I, I watch teachers plead with students, oh, just practice three times a day, three times a week, sorry, um, yeah. or just 10 minutes a day, which of course, none of it is adequate enough. Yeah. And I have classmates who proudly say, I don't practice between class. And yeah, it shows. Okay. So it's what you do alone. Out on the practice floor or your meditation or your study, your reading of scriptures and reference material, how you control your diet, your sleep, what you drink. Do you get high? Do you have you let go of getting high? How are you with other people? Do you have any compassion? Do you care about anyone? Would you sacrifice for somebody else? Do you stop and help someone? If someone wants to know something about something you do, do you say, well, no, you have to pay me before I tell you? Or do you just help take somebody out of their own difficulties? Can you free other people from those difficulties? That's all practice. Not just like, did I do 10 punches today? Can I do 20 push-ups? It's not just that. It's a whole lifestyle. And that's how you progress. Because everything has to be your practice. So it seems like, well, quite evident that your view of the individual's maybe purpose is re regardless of what they find as their purpose in life, the purpose greater than that is really to develop themselves mentally, spiritually, physically, healthfully, intellectually, in as a good as a good person in the greatest way that they can. Yes. And if yeah. I can tie that back to the beginning of our conversation, Please. that's how you are at your most natural. Mm. We have to give up this idea that, oh, I'm an individual walking through this world and everything else is the movie set. And everything else out there is just dumb background for my ambitions. No, you have to integrate yourself with your environment. And the way you do that is to realize all those different aspects that you just outlined, because that's what puts you in harmony with your environment. And that is what it means to be in harmony with Tao finding this authentic self, if, if we could use that term, perhaps. Um, the Taoist idea of, uh, or concept of Jing Gong or stillness practice, is that, do you think that's a fine way to really come to know your authentic self or to be a central core part of your practice? Yes, because now here's the misconception. Yeah. Okay, so let me just explain the doctrine. Yourself is empty, so by practicing, you realize emptiness, and that's what you should be. And people go, okay. And they imagine that they're looking into the center of a well, which is empty, and so that's who I'm supposed to be. 
if I may suggest, that's a misconception. The idea of emptiness can also be viewed as this, that there is no absolute intellectual reality. Everything is provisional. If I call something a horse, well, fine. But like, what kind of horse is it? Oh, it's a brown horse. Oh, what is it a mare? Um, you know, and so on. There, the, We must not confuse the labels for the reality. Mm. And because we often confuse the label for the reality, we get in trouble. So emptiness means that everything is subjective. You mentioned you have four children. They're your four children. I don't know them. I don't know your relationship to them. And I can never enter into that. So you have your subjectivity. I have mine. And to think that that has absolute reality is a mistake, right? Now, if I saw your four children among a group of 100, could I pick out the four that are your children? No, I couldn't. There's no absolute reality there I can invoke, all right? Now, if we understand that, then that means, first of all, we empty ourselves so that we're not enslaved to these false ideas of what reality is. That doesn't mean that there is no reality. It means you cannot perceive that reality solely through the screen of intellectual ideas and certainly not through social constructs. So you empty yourself. So why? Not because that's the end result, but because it then allows you to see life as it truly is without the screens, without the definitions, without the metaphors, just you raw in this world. And then the next thing is, if you empty yourself, do you see what tremendous faith that has? Because that means when you get up from the meditation cushion and you go out with life and you don't have to calculate and think of things and so on, it's because you have natural wisdom, ability, and understanding. So you clear away all of that junk so you can spontaneously be who you are. And you can do that because you've cultivated yourself. You've cultivated yourself so that you automatically know what to do, what to think, and so on. And it's going to be correct in terms of what you're perceiving because you're in that situation. To use a fighting metaphor, if I go, hey, you know, I'm going to go punch, 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 hook, punch, 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 hook, and the guy goes, bang. Well, all my plans were meaningless, weren't they? I cannot go into a fight like that. I have to react or anticipate or manipulate the situation, have a strategy and so on. But the constructs are not the fight. And that's why we empty ourselves even to fight so that we can just really deal with what's happening instead of saying, oh, it's going to go the way I want it to go. Well, that's ridiculous. Why, why do you think it is that people self-sabotage um, and themselves. And let me just give an example of something. Somebody, I see a lot of doctors, Western doctors and dietitians who are overweight. Now they know, so I'll just take this to the high, easiest level is they know all the ways to lose weight, all the programs, exercise, diet, fasting, et cetera, and yet they're not doing it. So why do we do things when we know an answer? It's different if you're you're ignorant or and uneducated to the answer. When people know an answer and they don't do it, why? To me, that's definitely self sabotage, because we know exactly what to do and don't do it for ourselves, but we're telling others to do. I think there are three reasons. Mm -hmm. The first is. Sometimes we have not mastered our own drives, our own lusts, our own um, drive for pleasure. So, hey, you know, if 
a little dessert is good. Why can't I have dessert every night? And it, I like it. It tastes good. I'm happy. I used to like to drink, but I have almost given it up completely because it's not good for me, but I like it. And notice the great social uh, arrangements around drinking. I have Nobody is going to argue with me if I go into a restaurant and order two cocktails. They like it. They're upselling. It's wonderful, right? Nobody is ever going to take a drink out of my hand. Everyone goes, oh, well, he's having a drink. He deserves to have a drink. It's okay. So you see how much of society is set up to encourage our indulgence. People are making money off of it, aren't they? It, the um, restaurants make their most profit off of alcohol. Um, corporations are selling sweets and desserts because you'll eat more of it. It's really hard for me to get a latte, like a, a non-dairy latte in a uh, cafe and not have some sort of fillers, sugar and salt in that non-dairy product. People are set up to stimulate our desires and that subverts us. So that's the first thing. So the first thing is, can we overcome our own uh, drives? and our own lusts, and our own appetites. That is not automatic, by the way. You know, just say, oh, well, you know, I'll cut them all off, and then you're miserable, and nobody likes being with you. You have to do it in a sensible way. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, most of us got negative messages growing up. We get dumped by a lover. Oh, you're ugly or you're not the man I thought you were. And then we hear that. And then we start performing that on ourselves. Hey, you know, no one loves you. You got dumped. I've had teachers in school mock me. Uh, I'm, this, I'm talking about Chinese school as well as regular mm -hmm. American school, right? You guys are so stupid. Oh, you'll never get this. You're too dumb for this. Oh, you want to go to that college? Huh, I think you better consider this. You hear all those messages and you hear those messages and they're more devastating and more penetrating than good job, I'm proud of you. Think back, to, I invite anyone to think back to their own childhoods. You might not remember grandma taking you out for an ice cream because it was happy and simple and well, it happened all the time after church and so on. But the one remark that says, oh, no, no, they're never going to do that. Oh, oh, you're not smart enough for that. Oh, look how clumsy you are. Oh, look how big your feet are. Oh, no, you're not the prettiest. You hear all that. So, hey, if the people who supposedly love me the most, if the teachers who are supposedly professionally there to uh, help my future, if they all say I am hopeless, then you start to reenact it. The third aspect is when we already feel insecure and who among us doesn't feel insecure? And then we figure it's safer to think badly of ourselves than to think highly of ourselves. There's nobody out there who rushes in and says, you know what? You really shouldn't think of yourself that way because it's not healthy. This is, oh, you know, hey, you know, that guy never gets it together, blah, 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 blah. So it's in a way, in a demented way, it's safer to think badly of yourself of course, we all want to avoid being arrogant, overestimating ourselves, and so on. But then, because we can't quite choose where to be in life, in that, can't quite realistically say what that point is, we err on the side of putting ourselves down. Because after all, everyone else does. Nobody expects anything of me. Nobody believes in me. So that becomes my internal dialogue. 
So that's why we self-sabotage. And in a weird way, it fulfills our expectation. You see, yeah. if I try to be a good martial artist, I try to be a good writer and so on, and I fail, that becomes more devastating than if I say, hey, you know, I'll never get there anyway. So then I've spared myself the effort. Not only have I spared myself the effort, but then I've spared myself the disappointment of getting to the top and finding that I wasn't quite there yet either. So you have to think about this, right? And this is, goes back to training in martial arts or Taoism. You might try and get to class and say, oh God, I'm, I can do this setting. And then you mess it all up. And then you go, well, uh, what did I expect? Hey, I'm nobody anyway. Or do you just say, I didn't do it this time. I'm going to go back home. And now maybe I have to do 200 drills a day instead of 100. You have to overcome all of that. After you overcome it, then the results speak for themselves. To my disappointment, when I can finally do it, the teacher goes, oh, fine. And then we never talk about it again. There are <laughs> steps that never get examined because, oh, you can do it. And so I'm always being dragged into the sets that I can't do. And it's just like, bang, bang, bang. You didn't do it again. You didn't do it again. You didn't do it again. But, but look, I did all this other. It doesn't matter, right? right? And look, wouldn't it be nice if like when I can finally do it, oh, they have a nice cake for me, something like <laughs> that. Like, oh, fine. This like, it's like, like what else? <laughs> I've been waiting by the side of the road for five years for you to get here. Now you're here. Let's go on, right? And so that's the way it is. That's just the process. <laughs> that's a nice analogy. That's actually pretty funny and and so true, especially among Chinese teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My my sifu would just always said, you know, okay, good enough. Yeah, then on to the next thing. I'm like, what do you mean enough? Like good enough? Exactly. Right. right. Good. You have to qualify it with the. Enough. How come the good doesn't offset the bad? Right. Right. But it's not about that. So yeah, it's it's important. This is why you know to your earlier question, the ego, that kind of um, expectation that we're going to be flattered or celebrated. Um, that somehow the good stuff offsets the bad. All those things have to be set aside. We're only trying to continue on with that journey. And if we see that there's a problem, like, you know, metaphorically, maybe our two feet don't point the straight way, we got to fix that, right? Um, so it's all about that process. And that's what matters. Did we find the process and did we continue with the process? And everything else gets in the way, including our own lack of self-confidence. So uh, ironically, we have to jettison that too. Feeling bad does nothing for you. And so you have to get rid of that too. It's just objective. Can I do this or not? Now, it doesn't mean you can't do it at all, right? Because anybody can get close to any technique. Two things, slow it down. And then how close are you to it? If I'm supposed to come straight up with, sorry, straight up with my hand like this, but I go like this. Well, does it mean I can't raise my hand? It means I'm not raising it in the right direction. So I need to just move it over, right? So at least someone is pointing it out to you because it's pretty bad when you go through a set and you think, hey, I'm doing so good. And everyone goes, oh, good enough, where they clap and so on. But your teacher's inside is thinking, oh, like that's 50 things wrong. But then they don't say anything. Do you know the strange thing is when you're not very good, they don't criticize you very much because they don't want to discourage you. So when you've been learning a long time, you're going to get criticized all over the place. And at least they do. Because if they don't tell you, you won't know. Yeah. So you should be happy that you're getting that criticism. 
I feel uh, fortunate in, in, I'm in my mid fifties now, but in my twenties, I didn't like it so much. And now I feel like, wow, I'm, I'm so fortunate that I, I know seven people who I can show something to or share something with, and they're giving me their honest feedback because that's seven different ways that I would never have known how to improve my writing, you know, my speaking, my teaching, my practice. Uh, and I have so many mentors to turn to, uh, to help me along the path. And I, I just think it's so important if you really want to grow, just man, be open to as much input as possible. Yes, and you mentioned your age. Yeah. So does it mean you can get to a skill and keep it? You have to maintain it. And as we get older, our thinking changes, our body changes. We have chronic conditions because of our profession. The times change. And so we have to continually readjust. And so it's not just a matter of like, oh, I learned this set and I'm done. No, you have to keep practicing it. You have to keep refining it. And you have to see what might change because of your aging, or maybe you forgot a move, or maybe it starts going awry in a certain direction or something like that. You need to be able to fix all of that. And I find that I'm looking toward a different skill sets within the arts and the practices than I was interested in earlier. You know, when you're when you're younger, it's all this activity and athleticism and machismo for guys. And you see the, the old masters and he moves so little or says so little, but so much is happening. And it's, you know, different level and layers of practice. I would compare that to a musician, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when you see a young musician, whether it's in classical music or jazz, it's like, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get to the older ones and they're just going like this, but the note is just, oh my God, it's exactly in the right place, the right pitch, the right, it just hits you just right. So do you need a million notes or do you need one person to just go bang and that just is right exactly right on time, exactly the right note at that time. And that's what age gives you, that experience and that wisdom. It doesn't mean you were wrong in your youth. It's a process that everybody has to go through. One of my um, favorite CDs, jazz CDs, is Kind of Blue, Miles Davis. And the CD starts out and there's other instruments and Miles comes in with one note and it just knocks you out. Just his very first note on the song. And you're like, there was, you know, four bars played and then he came in, hit one note and that was it. And like, you're devastated already. <laughs> yes. and, and that's, you know, the ability of a master, but of course yeah. also Cold Train and Cannonball are on that oh. album. And they play <laughs> no this extreme velocity right yes and there's room for both those style or all three styles right right but now that as a metaphor and to relate it to our conversation if you're cold trained you need to be cold trained but if you can only play like miles if only only <laughs> then, then you play like miles right yeah I don't know if it's true, but the writing said that, oh, Miles couldn't play fast. And so that's why he was, you know, the way he was. I don't know if that's true. But let's say it is just for the sake of this conversation. Let's say you can't do martial arts fast. So you can't do 50 jabs, you know, a leg sweep and so on. But you can bide your time to that one punch and bam. Yeah. So you do your martial arts the way you are meant to be. We're back to purpose and personality again. It isn't good if you can play like Miles, but you want to play like Coltrane and vice versa, right? And by the way, the real answer is you don't try to play like either. You play like yourself. That's correct. While we're on the subject of jazz, because I don't get to talk about it uh, enough, <laughs> but... Um, 
when I listen to a song like a love supreme by Colt, you know, Coltrane, my wife's like, what is that noise? He's just, you know, and he's just blowing his horn and I'm just sitting there. Like I'm listening to a Tibetan chant. I mean, it's like spiritual. If you, you know, the way he's playing, it's like, he's on another plane, even though it sounds all mixed up. If you feel it, it's a um, different thing altogether. Well, if it's if you know how there's always that question, if you were stuck on a desert island, what's the one album you would have? For me, it would be a love supreme. So you know. <laughs> and and yes, you know, Coltrane himself said that his music was spiritual. Mm. Well, what does that mean? I think it means that there was a complete honesty to the music, that there was no division between the music he played, who he was, or what he perceived, and what he understood his place in the world was. And he was true to that. By this conversation also, you know, Coltrane practiced like crazy. They said he would go back to his hotel room after the gig and practice <laughs> more. Like I can only aspire to that level of commitment. So he never by that implication said, oh, I'm Coltrane, I'm the best in the world, I don't need to do anything. He said, I'm going to get closer to where I want to be. Yeah. Right? As a side note, I like that kind of jazz because it's transgression, transgressive. Because it's not the dutiful playing of you know, a show tune or whatever that means also it's looking for something else it's a searching music it's mm -hmm. trying to get to a new place and that's what i like about it and that's what i hope our martial arts and our Taoism would be integrity true to ourselves not just a replication of something somebody else said and a, always a searching for what's new and fresh and engaged with the moment. Indeed. My mother was also um, was a classical pianist mm -hmm. and also a piano teacher. So of mm -hmm. course, my siblings and I all had to take piano lessons as a kid. A wonderful background. I wish I had had that background. Oh, it was fabulous because growing up, I, I didn't appreciate it until later. But growing up, we had all of these musicians from, I I'm live in, oh. Phil in Philadelphia, from oh, the orchestra. God at our house at playing piano, violins, trumpets, you know, like, forget oh, it. Yeah. It was just, you know, now I surround myself with Buddhists and Taoists and martial artists all the time. And it was like, that was hers was the music piece. And I, you know, but she, I really like as a piano player, this, the, the compositions of Thelon Thelonious Monk. Mm -hmm. My mother couldn't stand it when I play his CDs because it sounds like he's banging on the piano. His technique was not like a Hank Jones. It was not so, like a Tai Chi. It was more like a karate chop actions everywhere, you know, but that's a different trueness to his playing. Like what you're saying that he's being authentic in his playing. Um, Bud Powell was such a, a an amazing player. And one time Monk played for him just like in front of him, just like him. And he said, I can do that too, but I'm choosing to play this way. And, you know, that's like, what is that choice to hit those notes like that? And in martial arts, you have people doing applications and movements that just seem to not be the norm as well. But, but think about this. They're still the same 12 notes. Yes. And when you start to break down that music, oh, because I always thought, oh, wait, they must be using some note that's outside the scale. So it's like, oh my God, that was just a straight B flat scale. Right. Oh, he's those are, he's just playing the notes of the chord, right? They, they're not playing weird stuff. They're just putting it together in a way that is a different kind of music with the same 12 notes. That's amazing to me. It's just amazing to me how 
all the same, all the musicians are using the same notes, the same scale, the same instruments, and no two people sound the same. So I, you know, I endless. mother's point of view was, but for me, I like to hear what people do with the same palette, if you will, and find such great variation to it. We're talking about jazz of this period, you know, Miles and Monk and, and um, these people were talking about bebop and this creation of this new sound that was quite different from the jazz before. Um, and I think about, you know, what is it that's transpiring amongst a group of people at a given time that makes a practice of some kind shift into something that you couldn't imagine. Like nobody would have imagined rap until rap started, you know, came out because, you know, and and bebop, same thing is so different. And I take it back to the origin of Tai Chi, whether we want to say it was one guy or a group of people at Chen Village or whatever, but something happened that set their thinking about the martial art in a different direction. Okay, this is going to sound like a very weird um, transition, <laughs> but there's a reason for it. Yeah. I was recently at a military museum and it was, you know, had all these dioramas of different levels of conflict, right? And I realized that when you get to a certain point in history, the only way that the enemy can try to succeed is by developing new tactics. So at first, you know, there was no such thing as guerrilla warfare, and then they had to develop it. Um, there was no such thing as I, IUDs, but someone had to develop it, right? There was no such thing as an atom bomb, but someone had to develop it. When progress gets to a certain point, and one side is more powerful than the other, then the only hope that the weaker side has is to develop something, uh, some weapon or some tactic that will overcome the power. In the old days, they had walled cities. I, mean, I should say ancient times, yeah. they had walled cities. People had to figure out how to overcome that. Now we don't have walled cities anymore because we have, you know, air warfare, missiles, and so on. Walled cities won't do it. So why were there different innovations in martial arts? It's really because of asymmetrical warfare and people had to develop means to overcome them. I'm not sure if it's true, but at least what I've read is that Okinawan karate developed because the people weren't given uh, weapons, right? The weapons were outlawed. They still had to overcome the Japanese. Supposedly, uh, flying kicks are to kick someone off a horse. So if you take those just as metaphors, when there is a weaker side, they have to develop the techniques to overcome the stronger side. And then it goes back and forth, right? So now, if you talk about Chen Village and Taiji and so on, what would overcome hard and fast and strong? And let me remind you that for thousands of years, that was the role in martial arts, right? These guys in armor and so on. And if you read Chinese books, the legends and so on, supposedly these guys were just really big, and you know, it's an exaggeration, but, you know, two people would have to carry his spear because no ordinary man could lift it and so on. You take those as metaphors. Those peoples, those, those warriors, those generals were unbeatable. And yet people had to find a way to beat them. So now if over thousands of years, people got to the apex of fast, strong, and hard, well, what do we do? Soft and yielding what if we use his strength against him they had to find that and so whether they turn to philosophy as a start or whether it happened to uh, support what they 
discovered, then we don't quite know, but that's how I think internal martial arts happen. And let's say at best, it started in the 1600s. So in the context of Chinese history, which goes back thousands of years, that's relatively recent. They didn't develop it 3,000 years ago. They didn't have to. Therefore, internal martial arts arose because there was a need. And it succeeded for them, for that. Mm -hmm. It's a very good explanation. I haven't um, thought of it in that way. Um, Tai Chi, would you say, is an embodied, an embodied practice of Taoism? Uh, you're embodying Taoist principles in the practice of Tai Chi. Yes, I mean, let's leave aside the fact, the question of whether it, you know, started that way. Yeah, say, yeah. Historically, but now, certainly within the um, majority of Tai Chi's history, yes, it is an embodied Taoist practice. Why? The term Tai Chi, they didn't name it snake style, whatever, right? Yeah. Or name it after, you know, Shenzi province or whatever it was, right? It's named Tai Chi. That term predates the martial arts by hundreds of years. It's a term in the, in the Yijing, and it means the supreme ultimate. The supreme ultimate, Tai Chi, in turn, means yin and yang together. So what is Tai Chi? It is yin and yang together. So there was the yielding aspect, that's yin, and then people always leave out the other half. It's still yang, too. And when those guys hit you, they hit you just as hard as anybody else. Oh, but no, it's yielding and blood, Dallas. And the, no, they're going to hit you. And not only do they hit you, they aim at something vulnerable. So it's not just like, you know, I punched you in the face. I got a point. No, I'm going to crush your heart. I'm going to break your ribs. And because they're yanking you into that blow, yeah. then their impact is doubled. So you can see if you practice it right, it's far more cruel than um, external martial arts, right? Because they're using your own body weight. They're using leverage. Mm -hmm. They're pulling you into the punch. They're trying to aim at your internal organs. They're hitting your meridians. So, but... If you go back to the idea that it's yin and yang together, it's yin to yield, yang to attack. They just happen to attack you after they put you at a disadvantage. And that's what makes them so devastating. Now, that's the theory. Not everyone is good at it. Not everyone even wants to talk about martial arts in terms of Tai Chi. But for me, Tai Chi is at base a martial art. And it does embody Tao's principle chiefly because it's the entire thing is about the idea of yin and yang, give and take, um, hard and soft, up and down, fast and slow, and so on. You can go through a whole set just contemplating the marvel of how they've arranged that style to expose all these ideas. And you can go through a whole fight just using those principles. That's the whole point, right? Um, and that is always then a rehearsal of the philosophy. On your on your Facebook, just a few more questions. I won't take your entire day from you. <laughs> you had a nice analogy, um, or so I will ask: How is Tai Chi, the practice of a Tai Chi set, like a painting? Okay, so can we look at a Tai Chi set? It has a beginning and an end. Well, that might like seem obvious, but think about it. You start with your feet together. You separate your feet. You start moving. You go through all these variations. And then what happens at the end, you come back and you unify everything and you settle back down. So I would compare that then if you want to talk about painting to a Chinese hand scroll. And just in case people don't know, a hand scroll 
is sometimes, you know, 20 feet long and it's, you know, two rolls. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to look at one section and roll it up and move to the next section. It's kind of like a paper movie, if, if you will, right? It's never really meant to be displayed completely all opened. There has to be a left side and a right side. There has to be a beginning and an end. So if you look at one side of the hand scroll and the other, they're not going to be as dramatic as the middle, right? Because you, quote, start from nothing, you go through all the elaboration, and you go back to nothing, just like a Taiji set. In other words, a set is like a scroll of movements. And a scroll is like a Taiji set. The same thing. And all the variations... But think about it. Is the dramatic part in the middle, is that, quote, the content? Don't think, oh, that's the important part. Every part is important. The quiet part, the dramatic part. The little bush is just as important as the high mountain. Why? Because they all form a system. And we can't say one aspect of the system is unimportant. There's no aspect of a system you can take out because if you take it out, you alter the system. So there's no part of the painting that is less important than any other part. And there's no part of a Taiji set that is less important than any other part. And both are meant to be experienced. And both are the results of a performance. The artist happened to perform. They had to, if you will, start at one side and go to the other. The Tai Chi practitioner has to start at one side, go to the other, come back. Ideally, you end in the same place. That's a circle. The Tai Chi set is a circle. Yes, the painting looks long and linear. It's a circle too. It takes you on this journey and you end up back where you were. But what has changed? Not the set, not the painting. You, the viewer, you, the Tai Chi practitioner, you have been immeasurably changed by each set. And nobody who sees a painting can say they can unsee it. They saw it. The painter can't deny that the painter painted it. Everybody is changed by the painting. Everybody is changed by the Tai Chi set. And that is the virtue of painting and Tai Chi both. We've covered quite a bit of ground philosophically. And um, I would like to know what advice you would give somebody new coming in to find their true self, their authentic self, and wanting to embark on a practice uh, or a study of Taoism or Tai Chi or pottery on how to make a first step toward a practice and a mental finding a, a proper teacher. First of all, I mean, you outline a number of things, right? You have to decide what you want to do. That choice is up to you. And I would never question that choice. I know a young man who decided to become a potter. Fine. That's what you want to do, right? I have a nephew who became, who is in business school. Fine. That's what you want to do. You have to choose something. The next thing is you have to find a good teacher. And in Chinese culture, the way you find a good teacher is you ask about that teacher's background. How well trained are they? What is their experience and so on? And then I'm going to, as a side comment, tell you what my master told me. You have to like the teacher, just that. Um, yes, you can look up all the qualifications and they should be there, but do you like being with that person? Do you feel safe with them? 
he would tell me of going to see great masters and he didn't want to ask any questions by the time he got there. He just was, he just wanted to just sit there with them because he just thought, felt like, oh my God, this is where I want to be. And I don't even need to ask any questions. I feel so good and safe with this person. That's the kind of feeling that you want. Okay. And then further side comment, I'm going to tell you what my master said too. Don't go to anyone and copy their personality. You only go to a teacher to learn the best of what they have to offer and you let everything else go. So it's so tempting to say, oh, I wanna be just like him. I wanna do everything that he does. No, you wanna be just like you, right? So you need to find a good teacher, a good school, a good educational setting and so on. Don't be afraid you know, to go into it. And also, hopefully, you have a kind teacher, not that I ever always did. But then, you know, it's a, that's a separate matter. Um, who's going to be welcoming to you, right? And uh, who's going to help you? All right. All that being said, there's only one ingredient that you need to continue. And if I have any secret at all, it's this. Don't give up. It's that simple. If you think that's easy to do, think about that question a month later, a year later, 10 years later, 20 years later, and, you know, we've talked about great martial artists, great jazz musicians, and so on. And you look at their biography and go, oh, self-taught? Couple lessons already was on the bandstand, you know, uh, and so on. That's not the point. The point is don't give up. And let me tell you, and I've alluded to this already in this conversation, there have been great masters and great champions who gave up. Just don't give up. And if you don't give up, that means you can overcome all those doubts, all those questions, because you're going to say, look in the mirror and go, oh God, I'm such a slob again, but I'm going to try now. Don't give up. And that alone, that's all you need to become a superior person. Thank you so much, Dang Sifu, for your time today uh, and for your wisdom and your sharing. Uh, it's so much, um, it's very refreshing to hear it directly uh, instead of always hearing you with my voice reading your work. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I would love to have you on again in some time next year in 24. Yeah. And thank you. Enjoy your day. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for having me. I'll see you again. Thank you. Take care.